Um, Marita, when you translate a book, you know it pretty well. Um, you, from the first sentence, which is the most difficult one to translate, right up to the acknowledgements, when you're done, you think there's nothing more that you can learn about this book. And then the book arrives, and then you open it, and then there's a dedication in front, which you haven't seen. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. More. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, and the, uh, you see, read the de dedication, you haven't seen it before, and it shifts a little bit of the light on the book. So I'll read the one in here. I'm sure you know it all by heart. It goes like this. In memory of David Bishop, dedicated to all the men who didn't want to go and all the women who couldn't stay. So I want you to say a little bit more about this dedication, a bit about how it uh, touches on your personal life, but particularly how you manage in two sentences to somehow capture the two key themes of the book. I thought for a long time about dedicating it to... Um, to the men who didn't want to go and the women who couldn't stay. That was the thing that, while I was writing already, um, because you saw the translated version, you didn't see that. And then um, my ex-husband died um, after I went to Cuba, and I thought, okay, it would be good if I could do it in memory of David Bishop because some of those experiences he went through and some of my emotions, although it's purely fiction, some of my emotions um, I could, wouldn't have had if it wasn't for that part of my life. Mm -hmm. And it felt fair to me to, to dedicate it to him. Just briefly for those who don't know the story yet, who are the men who didn't want to go? And who are the women who couldn't stay? Well, I think um, the men who didn't want to go, I don't only mean the South Africans, the South African troopies. I mean soldiers in general. I think lots of the Cubans didn't want to go. Um, they went even further. Um, they went to another continent um, to fight a war that they, for some ideology that basically, they were as brainwashed, I think, as the South African troops who had to go. So um, I think it's broader and it's, it's, it's about all wars and about all the wars that you don't want to fight. And then the women, cannot understand because we are not there. Nowadays, and I mean, the Cuban side, there were women fighters too. There were some formidable um, female soldiers. But in South Africa, the South, on the South African side in the 70s, um, there weren't female fighters. So we, um, as daughters or mothers, can you hear me clearly at the back? Okay. No, really. no, is it? Yes, I don't know. Yes. It feels, I hear, I hear. But as I keep it closer. No. Okay, try this one. Is it better? Yes. There we go. Okay, right. We're getting the, getting the technical stuff out of the way. Um, so, uh, Yes, I think it's meant much broader. Wars in general with, with men. Um, we didn't want any yeah. women. No, it's not working. No, it's, <laughs> it's not working. I think it's where it is, the area it's in. So Hello, hello? Hello? Okay. No, I don't think it's working. <laughs> Choice of technology. Yeah. Let's check. <laughs> Maybe it's the area. Yeah. We'll check. We'll check. Okay. Um, you can take that one. You can try that one. Where was I? With the women, uh, the mothers, the sisters, the daughters, the um, uh, the women who got left behind and then had to try um, and often had to deal with. Um, wounded men coming back, or psychologically wounded, if not physically wounded, um, post-traumatic stress, um, and had to deal with that, um, and couldn't, because how do you deal with something if you don't know what you're dealing with? Because the men couldn't talk about it. It's part of the whole psychology that you can't talk about what you went through, and that you want to protect your family, um, your close ones, against what you saw there and what you did there. Um, so that's the thing that's, um, yeah, I suppose one of the sparks for the book for me was to try and get a little bit into that, into um, a, a, broader, a, a broader story from a woman's point of view. That's 
Maybe we should. Okay, um, that's what struck me about that dedication, about that sentence, is, is how that whole story is captured. But I want to talk about, I want to take the story a little bit further back and talk not about the book's beginning, but about, about the book's origins. You mention in the acknowledgments that it began with a phrase that you can be installed really loudly, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're very quiet and you talk very loudly. Yes. Yes. Fine. Okay. So you say in the acknowledgments that it started, it was sparked by a phrase that you read. Um, the phrase is about the incommunicability of war, which you read in a book that was written in 1976. A Polish journalist wrote it. It's about the war in Angola. It was translated sometime in the late 80s, um, which was when you would have been able to read it for the first time. When did you read it? I read it in the 90s. It's a day, uh, another day of life by um, the Polish um, journalist whose name I can never r really pronounce correctly. Please correct me if anyone. Ritzat Kapuczynski. I think it's the closest I can come to pronouncing it. Um, and I read it in, uh, in the 90s, I think maybe in the early 90s, when I was already thinking of writing about, I think the story has been, been carrying the story along for about 40 years, and I wrote, um, I had a book published in 94, can, anybody, can everybody hear me yeah, if please. I do it like this, yeah. called Childish Things, Dinner van a Kind, which deals uh, a, a little bit with that war. Teenagers, in the 70s, conscripts, uh, a boy dying um, in the border. So I was already interested in that. And I read, I think, around about that time I read the book. But that one sentence stuck with me. And, I, and when I decided to go back to, to this episode, um, so many years later, because I could see the damage doesn't go away. This is 40 years after the war, and it is still there. The, it is a lifelong thing that... Um, um, children, the younger younger generation, don't necessarily understand it um, because fathers don't always they don't talk to their sons about it, and definitely not to their daughters. Um, and yes, and then I, once again, and I thought, okay, how can you? So, so I suppose I was trying to do the impossible because I, it's like a motto that it's incommunicable, and still, well, that's what writers do, isn't it? We try and r write. Um, we try and say what you can't say. So I thought it would be a challenge to try and get into a little bit. My protagonist is a female, uh, is a woman who goes in search of somebody in Cuba. But there, there are brief excerpts from letters and diary, um, a journal while he was there. <coughs> so to get into that frame of mind. I had to, yes, I had to use a lot of imagination and do a lot of background research. Of course. That's what I wanted to ask uh, as well, which is um, for more than 30 years, you carry the spark of the story around with you. That seems like a really long time. And in between, you are telling other stories. So what, when did you know? Um, what was it that signaled to you that the time for this story has now arrived? It's always difficult to trace back because I wrote about, I wrote the story physically for about two years, and I, I write about the, the writing process in, um, I kept a blog, a writer's blog, I've done it now with three books, my last three adult novels, um, uh, because it's also a way of working out problems. So it's on my website, um, info. So for those of you who are interested in the, ecstasy and agony and trials and tribulations of uh, writing, actually writing the story behind the story. There's a lot of info in there. But before that, um, okay, so I went to Cuba in 2017, beginning of 2017, I already, so it was already, then I, then the, the germ of the story was already then, it would have to be a Cuban um, soldier. So um, in two, there were many sparks, one of the sparks was in 2006 at the, I was at the time of the writer festival in KwaZulu Natal, and I met an, um, an Angolan Portuguese writer named Jose um, Eduardo Agulusa, uh, who became a good friend, but we immediately clicked. Uh, there was just something, we were more or less the same age. He was an Angola, um, uh, the enemy. Uh, my classmates, I would say, my boyfriends were probably shooting at his friends. Um, 
uh, we clicked like we've known each other for years. We like the same books, the same music. We spoke spoke the same language, figuratively speaking, because his English was atrocious, and we spoke in French, and my French was very bad at that stage. Um, uh, so that was one of the sparks. I thought maybe I read that was the spark for for looking at the other side too, for not only telling it from the South African border experience side. And I thought, okay, if it was, um, okay, then Golans, I can take it one step further and look at the Cubans. What were they doing there? It was such a strange war for them. If it was strange for the South Africans to be sent to a third <coughs> country where you know nobody, that basically, Imagine the Cuban side of the story. They were also young conscripts, and they sent off to another continent uh, where they have to fight for some ideology because they were trying to please Russia. The South Africans were trying to please America in the beginning because the Americans pushed the South Africans into this war and then pulled <coughs> out. Um, and and for what? So so the, that was one of the sparks that thought, okay, it would be interesting to look at the Cuban side. So. I had to look for an excuse of how to get to Cuba, to get Cuba into the story. We'll get to Cuba in a moment. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it sounds as uh, we, we're having a very serious conversation, but Borderline is, above all, a rolling good story. It is a page turner. You read as fast as you can, because you have to find out what the end is. So I don't want to ruin that for anybody. And especially not because this ending arrives with a, with a plot twist. Yes. That um, that the reader couldn't anticipate, the character obviously couldn't anticipate. What I want to know is what about the author? Did the surprise ending surprise you? Yes, yes. I as probably um, some of my friends are crime fiction writers, um, and I think they're much more used to mm, quest, uh, the whole kind of searching and giving clues. Um, my books have been much more straightforward, but this is. It's not a crime story at all, but it's some. It, to me, while I was writing it, it had something of that quest of looking for something, looking for the, like you're looking for a murderer. I was looking for for a person because there was a letter to be delivered, and that's on the back of the book. Maybe we should just tell that because otherwise people don't know what it's about. After the husband dies, the ex-husband, they've been divorced for many years, and he dies. And she, the main character, Teresa Marie, um, finds a little box, um, uh, Army Memorabilia, Memorabilia um, 1975, 1976, it's written on. She opens it um, um, and finds an army dog tag and little things like that, little clippings about soldiers fallen. And also a kind of a, a, a little diary, uh, but she couldn't make out anything, and a letter. Uh, a stained letter, <coughs> and it's in Spanish, um, and she doesn't know, and there's an address in, in Havana that she sees, and so she gets somebody to translate it for her, and she finds out that this is, um, it's written by a Cuban soldier to his young, to his child, and she assumes that her husband, ex-husband must have killed the soldier, because how, how did this letter, how did he get to have this letter, and this letter was never delivered. And this child must now be uh, at least 40 years old. I've said the story in 2016. So uh, she sets off and she feels she has to make amends for what her husband did, for what, for what she didn't understand, to try and understand, to try and cope with what it was like to be um, a white teenager in the 70s. Um, and she goes off to search for the son or daughter of the dead soul, Cuban soldier. And that's the quest. And I didn't know while I was writing, because I went to Cuba first, I had a, okay, so there were certain cities that I, I made notes about, and I thought it would be nice if I can get Teresa here in Vanales, and it would be right if I can get her to Cienfuegos, and in Havana, of course. But how? So she has to meet Cuban people along the way to help her on this quest. And that was the, uh, for, to me as a writer, um, made it interesting while I was writing. That I didn't know who is she going to meet next and what is going to happen. As I was writing, and I literally didn't, didn't know. Usually I have an idea of an ending when I start a book, but it changes. But with this one, I literally didn't know. Is she going to find the person? 
at one stage, you know, is she going to find a dead person? Maybe just family members, maybe nothing. So where is she going to find the person? How? So that is what the book is about. And well, I hope the reader would also would also keep reading because of you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, if it was like a kind of treasure hunt and there are clues along the way. But when I think of the book, I do think of it as a quest. It starts with a blood-stained letter. And the discovery of that letter sends Teresa on a quest. This journey with all these obstacles to, get, to overcome. And then, of course, there's what you've hinted at now, sort of the deeper reason for the quest, which she and the readers will discover as we go. Um, and then there's the physical journey. So. Um, it's also a road trip, a physical road, it is trip. A road trip. It's a tremendous road trip in a very cool car. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but so, the car. Can I say something about the car? say something. <laughs> it's not a car on the cover, but it is a red and white car. It's a Plymouth Fury 1958. Now, I am not what you call a car girl. I usually don't even recognize my own car. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the cars are part of it. Even if you're not a car person, you are just bowled over by these old cars from the 50s, especially 60s also, but with the tail fins. And, and so I started asking around about cars, which I, my, my dad would have fainted if he heard that. Um, and and I, so taking pictures of cars, because I knew at some stage she was going to go in a car further out of Havana. And then I thought, and I saw this Plymouth Fury 1958, and I learned that this was also the car in Stephen King's Christine. Um, if any of you, Christine, although it's not a, a, a car with a cat that can come down um, in, 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 the, in Christine. I haven't read Christine. I'm not really a crime fiction re uh, thriller reader, um, but I know about this car. Um, so that was just another. And I saw it and I decided, that's the car that she's going to go in. <laughs> So, in Forget Me Not Blues, you took us to Portugal, and, and you, put, you, you took us to Portugal. I took, yes, I took yes. three days then to Portugal. Then, um, you lost me, you took us to Paris, and it's how wonderful that you took us on a trip to Cuba. No idea. Um, so once you, I want to ask why, but I want to say what I mean with asking why. Had you already decided that some of the story is going to have to take place in Cuba, and that's why you went on a very long trip? Oh, yes, yes. Um, well, it wasn't a very long trip. I was in Cuba for less than two weeks. Very far. Yes, yes, it was very Yes, yes, it was very far. Um, um, and it's difficult to get there and quite expensive. And so, But I knew there was no way that I could bring the Cuban side into the story if I don't physically go to Cuba. Um, and, and for many reasons, well, with any place that I write about, I have to hear the sounds and smell and smell the, the smells and so on. But maybe in Cuba even more because it's very hard because of the closed society. It's very hard to get an, to get an impression of what modern life Cuba or Havana is like if you're not there physically. Um, I, I did a lot of reading beforehand, but most of the, the, the <coughs> novels about the Cuban novels are mostly written about 90% of them by expats. Um, so they write from the United States or from Europe, and they write about with nostalgia about their childhood in Cuba um, uh, or about their teenage years. So to find modern day writers writing about modern day Havana is actually is actually quite quite tricky. So I found some um, historical stuff which helped with the back, historical background and how the country got. And then there's this one writer that helped me a little bit. And it's a crime writer called Leonardo Padura. Um, and he writes, he has a series of novels called Havana Blue, Havana Gold, Havana Red. I read it in French because it's actually quite popular in France, but it is translated in English too. And that helped me even before I got there. But it is interesting. It's, it's the only thing I could find because I think for the Cuban government, a crime novel is harmless enough. You could kind of insidiously criticize things in the country um, and you get an idea when you read it without becoming political. And I think the other writers just can't do it. It's, it's, it's still a very close society. So that was part of the challenge. And then, of course, comparing the Cuban messed upness to the South African messed upness, the characters uh, talking about their countries. <coughs> 
you'd love your country in spite of its mm -hmm. messed upness. What you've just said makes it, I think, even more remarkable that you seem to me, when I've been to Cuba, that you, you created this incredibly vivid sense of, of Havana as a city, and, and, and the characters in particular are so <coughs> vividly drawn that they almost seem to me to have an existence outside of the book. So I can imagine arriving in Cuba and seeing a tour guard like Oresta at the airport and getting in a taxi. And little Oresta. Little Oresta is getting in a taxi and there's big Ruben behind the wheel and I can walk into a bar and there's Lazaro behind the counter <coughs> and Miles helping out. So how do you do that? How do you invent characters that I'm half convinced are going about their business as we sit here? It's a wonderful compliment that you give me, and I don't know. That's a short answer. No, I suppose because I believe in them while I'm writing, while I'm writing them, I do know that with my um, my main characters, my protagonists and the main characters, I do. I cannot start a story before I have a a, 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 a the CV sometimes pages long to get to know the character like I know a good friend and everything from when this person is born to when who uh, their grandfather and grandmother were to what schools they went to, how many brothers and sisters and what the father did and where they grew up and how many times they, they moved when they were children. So all this, and I use maybe, but I've said this before, I use maybe 5% of that in the book. But before I start writing, I need that background to give me the confidence to to write about this character. And then as I write, it's like a friend. Sometimes they surprise you. They, you want to move them in one direction and you get to know the character and this character doesn't want to do what you want, doesn't want to fall in love with this person or get into bed with that one or get into a car with some way. Um, and, then you, and then you realize, um, yes, that's when it starts getting a life of its own. With the minor characters, I think it has something to do, I, I do have CVs for them too, but not in that, to that extent and then just <coughs> having to imagine them. And some of them started with a physical somebody, something I saw in Cuba, um, or not even in Cuba, elsewhere also. But there was one taxi driver that I took one short taxi trip in a pink um, Cadillac, um, in just from one place in Havana to another place. And he was a big guy with a Panama hat and kind of dressed in white. And that was the birth, that the start of Ruben. So I changed Ruben. This guy was bald, and I gave Ruben hair and a beard. And oh, he's got lovely uh, hair. And <laughs> <laughs> She's, she has a crush on Ruben. Um, a few other female writers have already asked me about Ruben. So I don't know. I, I just created this character, and there wasn't, there wasn't any kind of, in the beginning, physical attraction or anything for Teresa between her and Ruben. He's a taxi driver, barman. Um, what else does he do? He plays the trumpet in a band, like most Cubans, he has about three jobs. Um, and um, yeah, and there is a kind of attraction that, that, that happens in the book. Mm. Well, he is an extraordinarily attractive character. Big side of the room. Yes, mm -hmm. big mm -hmm. black yes. hair brushed back under his band. Well, I, quite, I saw him as a little bit fat, <laughs> not very <laughs> attractive, but, but she, <laughs> but she, yes. So I'm, I'm delighted that you, that you saw that. <laughs> There's another sense in which some of the characters in this book have a life outside and it's worth like this. If you will read your work very closely, you may recognize in this book characters that they met for the first time um, back in the early 90s. So it, it's a bit of a pu puzzle, especially if you don't recall Krit in very much detail. So I'm going to ask you to let that cut out of the bag and also describe this Merita universe, in which characters from different stories seem to know each other and migrate from one book to another unknowns. Yes, that in my blog. Um, if if you didn't read my blog, you wouldn't have heard <coughs> that. And I was wondering when I when I when I wrote the, the writer's blog, I knew now I'm giving something away. That's a game I play with myself to relieve the boredom of writing. But um, with previous books. I, that I've been actually been waiting for somebody to pick up on a character that they've made in another book, and then people don't necessarily pick it up, you know, because not everybody knows all my books and all the characters. Or it might ring a bell, but you don't necessarily go back to, because it's not, oh, it's often not the main characters. I mean, Griet is a character that made cameo appearances in other books. Um, okay, but then I think people see the name Griet, they know. Um, Mart from Childish Things popped up in other books, but they, but then there are also side characters, like in 
breathing space, a vacuum cans. I have a whole set of about 10, uh, 10, 10 friends um, having weekend get-togethers. And some of them pop up in other books. Um, because, and now in this book, there's two characters. Well, there's one you s that you see as a person and the other one that gets talked about um, stage, yeah. in the book. Um, um, that comes from Grit and, and well, Entertaining Angels in English, and Grit Comweer, um, mm -hmm. Traveling Light is the English. So, but I'm not going to tell you who that is. <laughs> it might be interesting for people who have read my early books. And that happens because I think I create most of my, most of my books. As my characters get older, as I get older, most of, I have a universe that's kind of Cape Town based. I sometimes have characters coming from Johannesburg <coughs> um, and, and Gauteng, and I sometimes set parts of stories there, but you, it's more or less this. It's, a, it's Cape Town, maybe Stellenbosch, and, it, and it's a certain, I think they could know each other. They could be friends um, from one book to the other as they get older. Because even then I would think back of Matt, the character from Childish Things, and she would be a certain age now, and she would know this one or that one. So I think that's what happened with this. I was writing, I, I was writing the specific character, the name popped up, and I realized that I, I know, I know this, I've heard this name before, I've used this name before. So I went to check, and yes, and then I, I worked out the dates, just to see if it could fit, um, if if she's the right age, if it could work, and it worked perfectly. Okay. Little games that us writers have to play with ourselves, to not to die from frustration. <laughs> <laughs> now, throughout this book, Teresa makes observations about what it's like to live in South Africa right now. At a time when the rainbow is fading a bit, we're becoming aware of sharp divisions between people. But you live in France, so how from that distance? Are you able to read the situation here so accurately that it brings true for your readers here? How do you keep in touch? I think by physically being here at least twice a year for a few weeks at a time, um, some years I've been three or four times, um, by, by um, reading all the Afrikaans newspapers nowadays, also Freya Vietblad, thank heavens, um, uh, and magazines, and listening to podcasts of um, uh, Aris Gier, and basically just keeping in touch with friends here, yeah. um, um, social media, uh, reading the things that people, that my friends <coughs> post on, on, on social media. And it's, it's, um, it's unimaginable for me not to try and keep in touch, because this is still what I write about, even if my characters in my last three books uh, the books were partly set in other countries like Portugal or Paris and now uh, Cuba, but it is still South Africans and I will always write about South Africans. But I do find it's a, it's a, it seems to be a trend in <coughs> Afrikaans literature at, at least that a lot of what's been published recently, I find in the last year or two, actually books set in other countries, either by people living in other countries or um, just have traveling in other countries. And I think it just reflects the, our world, <coughs> our, not necessarily diaspora, but just the fact that we all travel much more than we used to 30 years, 30 years ago, and, and, and that um, South Africans are all over the world. So um, Afrikaans literature is definitely also reflecting that. So you travel a lot. And over the last few years, you have turned travel into a bit of a side gig. So you're an author and also a tourist. Yes, um, one of those unexpected things that happens in your life while you're making other plans. Um, and the culprit is here tonight somewhere. I don't know where she's hiding. Kitty Snowman, um, there at the back. Um, we did a tour together for somebody else many years ago. Kitty is from Rufaro Destination Management. She's been a tour guide forever. And she's very, very um, um, knowledgeable and experienced. Um, and then she twisted my arm after we did this other tour. And she said, but you know, let's do a, a Provence tour. You know Provence so well, and you know the food. And that was after my food program that I did with my French cooking husband. 
Um, I've done strange things in my life, and one of them was a food program, Marita Cook, where I visited South Africans, South African French connections all over the south of France, 13 episodes. You know about cooking programs, and how fake it can be to cook in front of the camera, to cheat all the way through. <laughs> so, okay, so one of the things I did was that. Um, and, and then I said, okay, I don't want them coming close to my house because I'm not a, um, I don't have a, a bed and breakfast or anything like that. I, so I don't have anything to sell to South Africans. I actually want to keep people away from my house so I can write. And Kitty said to me, but it's okay. We, you, you know, you can show them all the villages around. You can show them things, you know, they don't have to come to your house. Anyway, she convinced me and I actually enjoyed it. Um, and we did more than one tour like that, small groups, 10 people, the most we've ever had was 15, because I don't want to change into a Japanese tour guide with a little flag and 50 people behind me. <laughs> and usually the people are nice, um, but because they, I suppose they readers, or they know my work, or whatever. Um, and then then I, after the Portuguese book, um, Forget Me Not Blues, Die Blow von Ho, readers actually contacted me and people who've been on the Provence tour and asked, well, what about, don't you want to take us to Portugal because there's also a kind of a quest. And I said, okay. So we did that and we did, we've did. we done two Portugal tours and, and then people started saying, well, where are you going to go next? Um, and that's how Cuba happened because I wanted to go to Cuba and it was very expensive. And you know, um, in spite of what people think, I might be best-selling Afrikaans also, but that doesn't mean <laughs> a lot, um, especially if you live in Euro. So I didn't really have money to go to Cuba. It's very expensive to get there. And then Kitty said, but let's do a little group and take some people to Cuba. Um, come on, take Cuba some with Marita. Come and discover Cuba with Marita. And that's what happened. We had a, got a group together of about 10 people, readers, some very interesting people in the group. Um, and I felt um, like I had scouts with me. It was wonderful because they all knew I was writing a story that had to do with the Angolan War. So um, they would get into a taxi um, or uh, meet a bartender and come back and say, this guy, this, we spoke to this guy, his brother was in Angola or somebody else's neighbor um, is in a wheelchair shot in Angola. So I had all this stories. It wasn't only me um, talking to people and making notes. I had the scouts could, could, could help me. You could also come in contact. And uh, I think, yes, and then that expanded. And so we've done a few other things. So now <coughs> next year in March, we're going to India, passage to India with a literary slant because I love Indian, um, English Indian writers, you know. And I feel, it feels to me, Kitty has been in India at least six times. I've never been there, but it feels to me as if I know it, because I've read so much um, set in, especially in um, Mumbai and Delhi and that area. So we, we organize a tour uh, uh, around culinary experiences. Once again, we do a cooking class and we do visiting the markets and so, but also to do with a little literary slot. Um, people get a reading list before. <laughs> speaking of reading lists and, um, and speaking of travel, what did you read? That was Okay, on the way here. Um, on the way here, uh, I think I was, I wonder if I read anything, I think I read a magazine. <laughs> I was so tired. I am reading a book now that, that I borrowed from a friend, because if I travel like this, I try and just read a few sentences at night, and quite by chance, my friend, um, also sitting in the audience there, um, um, gave me this book called Less. Um, about a writer, of, um, um, Andrew Greer, Andrew Sean Greer, I think that's it, and, and, and it's a book about a writer on tour. Um, uh, well, he has a reason why he goes all over the world, because he wants to get away from the marriage of an ex-lover that he doesn't want to attend. Um, and it's an absolute, absolutely delightful read, um, light and humorous and funny, and exactly what I need while I'm on tour myself, because before this part of the tour, I also did, did um, a week of school visits, um, because I'm also a young adult fiction writer, and I did school visits, and that's exhausting, because mm -hmm. there you're not preaching to the converted, you have to keep their attention, and try and light a spark in some eyes, and you know, having some, some light reading, maybe a few sentences that might you fall asleep. Hmm. The standout books of 2019? 
Standout books of 2019, yes. So um, African and international. Um, I think uh, one that uh, South African Ivan Vladislavik, um, also a name that I always have difficulty pronouncing, The Distance, about a young boy in, in, in Gauteng in the 70s or 80s becoming obsessed with Muhammad Ali um, and boxing. And it's a kind of book that if anybody else wrote it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have even picked it up because I'm not interested in boxing. Um, but he's a South African writer who can write, I think even his shopping list would make <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> I would read it, he would make it interesting. So that's the <coughs> standout books. Um, I also reread, um, there's an Afrikaans writer um, who, uh, who died this year, Harry Kalmer. Um, his one book um, got, his one translated book, A Thousand Stories of Johannesburg, um, won an important prize, won the Sunday Times Prize. Um, I think he wasn't appreciated enough by the Afrikaans literary establishment while he was alive. And I read, reread all his books this year. Um, and one of my favorites there was, an, uh, all of them, uh, I love all of them, but the one that stuck with me was an, the Afrikaans title is, and I don't think that's translated, it's In the Lekkerste Deel van Doodwees. It has the ironic title and the, the loveliest part of being dead. Part of it is, a, is told from the perspective of a dead person looking at us. Um, and so that touched me in a specific way because I read it after his death. Um, international, I, I've, I'm, recently I've become quite a fan of Ali Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, winter, autumn, I haven't read spring. Um, but I, you know, um, I've been a Margaret Atwood fan for 30 years, and I think it's a pity that she only wins now. She should have been, um, I think she wrote better books before that she should have won the Booker Prize for maybe a long time ago, um, but rather late than never. So yes, all that, I would say, a lot of the, I don't specifically read, only, I read a lot of male writers too, but some of those that I really admire would probably be like, you know, Margaret Atwood, Toni Morrison, um, the big females, <laughs> uh, um, Hilary Mantle, oh, I'm waiting yeah. for the next one, for the Wolf Hall, next checking. one, yes, yes, so, yeah. So, your travel schedule, does it, are there any clues in there about what you might write about now? India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, the wonderful one of the things I, for me, what travel travel gives me ideas. Travel stimulates me in many ways. Um, when I was younger, I thought it was just because it gives me the freedom to get away from my children um, and and the house, um, and that I literally had more time to make notes and, and, and talk about things. But now I don't have that excuse anymore. My children have all left the house. And I still find, I think it has something to do with moving out of your comfort zone. Um, to get stimulated and to get ideas for stories um, for me, if I'm out of my comfort zone. And my comfort zone is at home where I sit. So the moment, and especially if I go to a place where I don't know the language, um, where it's really foreign, like Vietnam or India, uh, then, um, then because I was in Vietnam early this year also with a little group and it was a wonderful experience. But that, uh, that, then it's not necessarily, I'm not necessarily going to go out and write a story about Vietnam, but some of the experiences there um, find their way into other stuff that I write. Maybe characters you meet or scenes or maybe a short story or something. Do you know, you don't have to tell us, do you know what story you're gonna tell us? <laughs> Um, yes, I do, and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, about, about I, I always know, sorry, I have just maybe have to add that it's, it's one of those, I think, I always, I feel the day when I write the last sentence of a book and I haven't already a good idea of where I'm going next, I think then I'll tell myself, okay, I have to stop writing because you don't have to stop searching. But it, it's always, um, there's lots of ideas and there's one thing coming up and I do that and then while I'm writing, as I go towards the end, the next thing starts coming up, coming up. And so, yes. So, three books ago, as you said, you started this writing book. Um, kind of 
recording all the experiences uh, as you research and as you write the book, and then when the book's published, um, it goes live on your website and we can, we can kind of read behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely riveting, it really is. Um, because you also talk about other things that happen in your life, but you talk about the book and yes. about how... I try and not talk about too much about the other things, but yeah, yes, little snippets come in. Okay. And so the fear of writing those first few pages and when the fear becomes less and what scene you're going to be, what's, what's gonna, you're going to deal with next and what may happen next and not happen. Um, and I try not to give spoilers, for, but it is better if you first read the book and then read that then because then you will recognize that. But I try not to tell, you know. But process-wise, does that help, this dialogue you have with yourself about the book? Does it help the book? Absolutely. Well, it helps me, and then I hope it helps the book, because fiction is a very, very lonely business. Um, I think maybe if you write non-fiction, you can still maybe discuss what you're doing, because you're doing research on a specific subject, and you can discuss with people. If you write fiction, and you make it all up, there's nothing on the page. I have to invent these characters, I have to invent a life for them, I have to invent things that are going to... Who do I discuss it with? Because nobody has read the book while I'm writing. I can not I can maybe tell my partner about it, um, but it's not real to if anybody hasn't read the book. So in that way, um, I found about three books ago that helps me if I do... Um, if I, it's like therapy, I suppose, in a way. If I get stuck, if I, I, I would write, I don't do it every day, maybe sometimes two, three weeks go past, I don't, and sometimes three times in a week, and I could work it out for myself, in a way. And then I also started doing it in English, which is well, the first one um, I wrote in Afrikaans three books, books ago, and, and when I went on my blog, there were people saying, okay, it would be in English, in English too, and I thought, okay, it's also a different, it removes me even more from the book that I write in Afrikaans if I write uh, this part, this little talking to myself in English. It's a very, very generous blog. You share a lot. And one of the things you share... Well, I hope not many people would read it. <laughs> 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 well, I'd tell everybody to go read it. <laughs> so, you also provide the insight uh, in, in, in a couple of entries that I have read recently into how precarious the righteous existence can be. I'm going to read it back to you. Oh, so, I'm going to be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> On Tuesday, 24 October 2017, you wrote the following... And suddenly today it struck me I need to apply for a bursary or some sort of financial help. If I want to write this novel the way it should be written, I cannot do it with one eye on the calendar trying to work out how long I can survive and maintain my children at university before my money runs out. So that's what I'll do this week. And then it's just over a month later, you know the outcome of the application. You write that it's hard. The question is, what does it take to keep going? because you can't do anything else. So I didn't get the bursary. Um, a very, uh, somebody who really deserved it got it, so I, there's no bitterness about it. Um, but then, yes, then I thought, okay, so deal with it. I, what else can I do? I have to keep writing. If I, had, if I got the bursary, I would have probably gone back to Cuba another time. I, I would have allowed myself more time, um, more research, but then there's a kind of a, 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 a clock ticking and saying, okay, now you don't have the time, your money is going to run out. Um, and then being an old journalist, I'm pretty good with deadlines. Um, it's very stressful, but it, it helps me in a strange way to give myself a deadline because I start writing better as the, as the deadline comes closer. So maybe, you know, I don't want to say it's good I didn't get the the bursary, I would love to have more comfort when I write, but okay, that's the way, you know, I can't do anything else, so I'll just keep on doing it, whether I have money or not. So, in closing, one of the most touching scenes in the book, it's a very sexy scene as well, is one in which one character reads out loud to another character. So, I can't tell, say much more about that scene, except that it's towards the end of the book, it's absolutely worth waiting for. So, in closing, I'm going to ask you to read aloud to us from your book. So I've chosen a scene. It's one of my favorites. It introduces one of those delightful fringe characters that you find throughout the book. And, um, and I also love the humor, so I've marked it for you. 
Okay. It's stuck there. And there's not very much. From, from the gate then, yeah. Okay. I just want to see which one is the one. Oh, <laughs> okay. It's the. I love her. I like it too. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, Teresa and Ruben arrives at. Uh, they're on this quest now and they're looking for this character, so they meet people. The gate isn't locked. And given that there's no bell or any other means of announcing their presence, they simply push the gate open and walk up to the largest of the three houses, the one in the center. The small structure to the right of the gate is what would probably be called a granny flat in Cape Town's well-to-do southern suburbs, a garden flat with one or two rooms. But the exterior walls are painted in a shade of turquoise you wouldn't easily find in the genteel Cape Town suburbs. The house in the middle is canary yellow, with an ugly cement staircase leading up a side wall to a flat roof where a third home was evidently added later. Its windows in, different, in a different style to those on the ground floor. The walls more orange than yellow <coughs> and next to the orange-yellow roof apartment is a rainwater tank on the side of which is a gigantic black and red painting of Che Guevara's face. Teresa's eyes flick from the rainwater tank to Ruben and back to the tank with such a bemused expression that he shrugs and says, he's everywhere, isn't he? <coughs> Is there a law that says every street in the country has to display this guy's face in a highly visible spot? She asks. I think it's just that we like him and we discovered that our tourists like him even more. <coughs> they can hear a radio somewhere, but there's no reaction after Ruben is knocked on the front door of the yellow building a few times. When they turn around to try one of the other doors, a woman appears on the stairs leading up to the roof apartment and greets them in Spanish. Ruben raises his Panama hat and returns the greeting with old-fashioned chivalry. The woman smiles and commences a stately descent. Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard is the image that immediately occurs to Teresa because they are gazing at an apparently middle-aged woman who refuses to accept that her glory days are behind her. Her shoulder-length hair has been dyed corn yellow with a fringe that hangs suggestively low over one eye. Her pink t-shirt hugs her body too tightly and the round neck neckline is low enough to display a pair of breasts separated by deep cleavage. Across these breasts, the word pretty woman are spelled out in bright pink sequence. The letters slightly distorted due to the great circumference of those breasts. Her white capote <coughs> pants are likewise precariously tight around her strong thighs and wide hips, but her waist and ankles are slim, her brown calves shapely, her neck fairly lean. She's not what Teresa would call beautiful, just slightly too vulgar for that, but some older men would probably find her attractive. Like an overripe banana whose skin is turning brown, but which may well taste just as good as a fresh young banana. <laughs> At least that is what Teresa surmises when she notices the mischievous sparkle in Ruben's dark eyes. He says a few words in Spanish to the woman who introduces herself as Benita Madrigal Rosabal. What a lovely storybook name, Teresa extends her hand in greeting, but the other woman barely glances in her direction. Benita Madrigal Rosabal's full attention is seized by Ruben Torres Marquez's large, ringless hand that is likewise extended in her direction. Call me Benita, she says with an arch little laugh, if I can call you Ruben. <laughs>